In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today, we're going to be continuing our series in the book of 1 Samuel. And what's going on here is that Saul is about to ride into battle. He's about to lead Israel's troops into battle against the Philistines. They've already had some success. His son Jonathan has actually already been a big part of that. They have had some success against the Philistines. And so they're making ready to, to make a big push and to drive the Philistines out of their land. And what is planned to happen here is that Samuel has told them, in seven days, I will come there and I will make an offering before the battle and then you can all right into battle, and, and that will essentially be the offering that we give to God and praying for, for victory and safety and all that other stuff that you would expect that comes with going in to a battle. So Samuel has already made this promise to Saul, seven days comes, Samuel's nowhere to be found. And so because Samuel is late, we see that Saul actually goes ahead and makes the offering himself. He goes ahead and, and makes the offering without Samuel there present, even though he said, wait for me, I will be there, and when I am there, I will be the one that offers the sacrifice. Saul, who is not supposed to be the one that is offering the sacrifice, goes ahead and does it anyway. And that brings us to where we are in this particular story. But Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw the people were scattering from me, and you did not come within the appointed days, and the Philistines were assembling at Michemash. Therefore, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not asked for favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Samuel said to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom forever over Israel. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him ruler over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Now, this is the moment. This is the moment that God says to Saul, You're done. You're done. You're not going to be the king forever. I'm not going to establish the kingdom in your name. Your family is not going to be the one that sits upon the throne of Israel from here on out. I've got a replacement lined up. You will be replaced as the Lord's anointed king. Why now? Why is this the sticking point? Why is it that at this moment, God is the chosen now to inform Saul, yeah, you know what, I would have established the kingdom in your lineage forever if you had just done what I told you to do, but since it's obvious that is not what is going to happen, I found somebody else. I'm going to have somebody else take your place. Now, to the average person looking on, they might read this and go, doesn't that seem a bit harsh? Why is it this moment specifically that God chooses, like, nope, that's a bridge too far, I'm done, you are no longer going to be my anointed, my spirit is going to depart from you, so on and so forth. Well, I think there's actually several really good reasons that God made this decision. First of all, the most obvious one is disobedience. Saul knew that he was not the one that was supposed to do this offering, and Saul knew that that's something that is reserved for the priests, the Levites, and the prophets. That's not something that the king is supposed to be engaging in. And so not only was the command to hold off and wait, and I'll be there, even though he was a little bit late, not only was that being disobedient, but he was also being disobedient to the idea of his role in the kingdom. Just because you are king does not mean that you get to do everything. Just because you are the king doesn't mean you are the end-all, be-all. And this was a big statement to Israel that, look, not even your king is above obeying my laws. When he does wrong, I will punish even him. I'm ultimately the one that commands you. I'm ultimately your judge, not the king. The second part of this is, 
Do you notice that the reason that Saul gives is not really one that a spiritual leader should be giving? He said, well, the people were essentially telling me that we need to go ahead and do this, and the people were scattering from me, and and everybody was leaving, and morale was going down. I was like, okay, I'll do it. Okay, I'll be the one that offers sacrifice. Let's go ahead and, and let's go. So Saul bent to public opinion. He did something that he knew was wrong because people were urging him to do it. That's not a leader. That's not a king. Not a good one anyway. Certainly not one that is obeying God. One that looks, okay, here's God's command. Here's what people are asking me to do. I'm going to go with this one. Nope. Not something you get to decide. If you have a choice between obeying God and obeying man... You're supposed to obey God. And because Saul chose to do what the people wanted him to do as opposed to what God wanted him to do, that was a pretty clear indication that, all right, this guy is no longer fit to be God's anointed king. And then finally, and this is sort of going along with the rationale that was given, not only was Saul bending to public opinion and and doing what the people wanted instead of what God wanted, but he was trying to defer responsibility for that. That's another very unking-like, unleadership, uh, that's not even a word, a very unleader-like quality to have. Because if you're somebody that is supposed to be leading people, if you're somebody that is supposed to be helping people see them see you as an example as what to do and how to follow God, this isn't it. When you look up and go, Oh, well, yeah, I did it, but, you know, the people made me do it. Well, that's the same thing that Adam said about Eve. Oh, well, yeah, I did it, but here's the reason why I did it. Saul doesn't take responsibility. See, what a leader does is say, yeah, there were other people that may have influenced my decision, but the buck stops here. Saul was the one responsible, and it should have been Saul that went out and said, Look, Samuel hasn't arrived yet. We will wait for him in the Lord's blessing. And if people leave, they leave. If we go in with a smaller force, that's fine. I would rather put my faith in God than my army. And remember that when his predecessor, David, actually did the same thing, God punished him for doing the same thing too, putting his faith in his army as opposed to God. See, when you put your faith in God, you say, you know what, we have to go in with a few less troops. Oh, well, I would rather have God in the host. I would rather have God in the the backfield than I would extra people anyway. And that was really where Saul messed up. And I think it's very obvious that the reason that this replacement was about to take place is because Daniel, or sorry, Daniel, David did the exact opposite. There were many times where David had people, for example, when he was about to take Saul's life, urging him on, egging him on, saying, hey, David, look, you got to go ahead and do it. It's for the good of the country. It's for your good. God has already said that he's going to deliver Saul into your hands. And, And David says, no, that would be raising my hand against God's anointed. And I will not do that. I don't care what anyone else says. That's a leader. That's a person that is after God's own heart. And what happened when David screwed up? What happened when David made his great sin with Bathsheba? We get one of the most beautiful repentant psalms in the entire Bible. Where he says that, I have sinned and I alone. David didn't blame anybody else. He put the blame right where it belonged, himself, and he begged God for forgiveness. Saul's over here trying to deflect blame and say, no, 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 it was really the people's fault. That's the reason I did what I did, even though I knew it was wrong. See, there's a very, very stark contrast between the two. David, even though he wasn't always obedient, had a heart for obedience, and when he did mess up, he always went back to God, took responsibility, asked for forgiveness. And his disobedience wasn't because he decided it was better to to play along with and do what men wanted him to do rather than God. There's a very stark contrast between these two people. 
And I think that's really what it all boils down to is we can talk about some of the tangential issues, but ultimately it comes down to a question of, do you want to follow God or do you want to follow men? Because Saul followed men and we see how that turned out for him. David followed God and we saw how that turned out for him. If we want to be a David, that when there's pressure and people are expecting us to make a decision and we have to choose what direction we're going to go, we have to ignore what the world tells us that we need to do and be obedient to God. And that's how to be a David and not a Saul. Stay the course, friends. It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.